Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of the Mission Matters Business Podcast, your source for all things business. My name is Adam Torres. You can follow me on Instagram at Ask Adam Torres. Keep up with my book releases, tour schedule, signings, all that other good stuff. Always love to connect with you there. And as always, if you'd like to apply to become a co-author of one of my upcoming books, just head on over to the website, missionmatters.com, and click on Become an Author to Apply. All right, so today I have Kevin Schultz on the line, and he's co-founder and president over at the 3-5 Spin Company. Kevin, welcome to the show. Hey, Adam. Thanks for having me. Great to be on. All right, so I'm um, excited to get into what, uh, today's topic. So we're going to talk about a little bit of compliance in the hemp space and what that looks like moving across state lines, some of the intricacies there, and uh, some of the things that the 357 company does. Um, so let's just start out. Let's just kick it off with talking about uh, the 357 company in general. Tell us a little bit more about what you're up to. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, so back in the summer of 2019, I was um, wrapping up a, a, a stop in the, on the medical cannabis side of, of the business and um, saw a hole in the supply chain on the hemp side of the business. Um, there's overlap between the plants and, 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 you know, the two businesses share some common interests. And um, the, the, the hole I identified was the logistics space in the supply chain. And I felt that the industry was going to need a company that came in and built out some real SOPs that uh, were compliant and all above board and really helped um, build out that component um, to ensure the longevity of the industry. So um, I partnered with a, an expert from the logistics space. We brought in a couple of strategic partners to help us um, with our carrier network and um, really just dove in and started to create a niche centered around the transportation of hemp over state lines, as you mentioned. We also do a fair bit amount of uh, general commodity freight, um, and we also have a marketplace that allows our customers to cross off that procurement part of their to-do list, and we've gone out and seeked out reliable, consistent products that our farmers and processors can go on and, and source um, you know, as their businesses mature. Let's uh, talk. I don't want to assume that everybody listening understands what the compliance of moving um, the product looks like. Let's talk a little. Let's go a little bit deeper there. Sure. So um, to understand the supply chain, you know, the the product is obviously an agriculture product. So there's farming involved. So you have farmers who are identifying genetics that need to be compliant. And when I say compliant, if you look at the the rules and regulations in the current 2018 Farm Bill, and then the reiteration in the interim law all the THC percentages need to be below 0.3% total THC. So when a farmer grows their crop, assuming everything is in compliance and it passed lab testing along the way, once the product is harvested, they then are looking for a processor to potentially offload the raw material to if they're not a vertical organization, meaning they do the processing on site. So once the raw material is dried and packaged and stored in bulk bags, it then needs to move to the processor. So that's where we come in. We handle all the paperwork. We verify the certificate analysis are compliant. We meet with the local state uh, officials from the highway patrol to the Department of Agriculture's along the entire route to ensure there's not separate permits or licenses that we need in addition to the ones we have already. And we make sure to secure any checkpoints we need to stop at along the way. So really about moving what at that point would be biomass to the processing facility, and then once that processing facility further processes the raw material, they're left with an end product that needs to go to, let's say, a co-packer. So now that concentrated oil or um, distillate, they call it, needs to move in a compliant manner to the co-packer or whoever's going to create the end product that eventually gets sold into the retail market. So really it's about moving this product from A to B, a lot of times from B to C and even C to D or even back to the original person that grew the product for whatever their purpose was to have an end product, call it a tincture or any sort of medicinal product, or even on the agriculture side, on the industrial hemp side of things, fibers, textiles, and so forth. So really we're there to identify the proper documentation, fully vet the certificate of analysis, these, fully vet the farmer's licenses, fully vet the, the license pr on the processing side well. So there's a significant amount of setup and onboarding that goes on mm -hmm. um, prior to shipping one of these uh, shipments. And then we just make sure that the truck has GPS tracking, 
and there's full visibility along the entire route. And if there are some states that tell us to stay away um, because they don't have their policies, you know, really structured or mapped out, um, we will avoid those states. Um, but it is a legitimate business in America now. The Farm Bill specifically states that, that we should be able to interstate transport this product um, as long as it's below the 0.3 total THC threshold, which anything above that they consider uh, cannabis. And so um, is this, I just have to ask, is this is my, my being naive, is this the common? So is that, are most companies that have been transporting like this uh, remaining compliant like this? Because it sounds quite complicated. You know, gosh, I hope so. Um, you know, I, I, we look at this as we have a passion for the industry. We want to lift mm-hmm. the entire supply chain up. There's a fair amount of uh, education that goes up and down that supply chain. Everything mm-hmm. that we do, speaking on behalf of 357, of course. is in the best interest of the industry long term. We're not here to make a quick buck. We want to be at the forefront of policy, advocating on behalf of the industry, whether it's state by state or at the federal level. And we just want to make sure that we are being overprepared as possible because the last thing the industry needs is a black guy right now. Mm-hmm. And having something going over state lines that's non compliant certainly will not only end up in court, all parties involved in that transaction, mm-hmm. but also it, it tarnishes the reputation of the industry. And this early on, um, you know, similar to when I started in the cannabis industry back in 2014, mm-hmm. you know, it's really important that the industry did not get the exposure and the ne- negative exposure in, in the media or in the public's eyes. And so I think very important that we set the standard of excellence on how this is done and personally, I hope these SOPs live long after me in this industry, and that these are truly standard operating procedures that the industry can build off of. I love it. I mean, it makes a lot of sense, and, and it all has to start somewhere. That's the way I look at it. So doing it like what you're doing and doing the really the hard work of creating that model um, allows the infrastructure that other businesses and, you know, many people will be able to build on in the future. So I love that. Um, that being said, I don't want to assume that all of our um, listeners are, are completely um, familiar with the hemp side of, of the market because I, I think it doesn't get as much media attention and other things. Can you just talk briefly about maybe some of the products and some of the things that the biomass um, goes into? Yeah, absolutely. So on one side, you have the medicinal side of the product. So you have your CBDs and CBGs, which are cannabinoids that exist inside the hemp plant. Um, there's there's a great need for further studies internationally. A lot of these studies done. So there's an extreme, extremely uh, large potential on the on the medicinal side. And then you have the other side of the of the hemp plant where farmers can grow for more industrial type products. I believe the last time I saw it, it was about 20,000 different consumer goods that can be used from various parts of the plant, whether it be the yeah. stalk or, or the leaves themselves and so on and so forth. So really there's just a ton of uses for hemp in America. Mm-hmm. You know, it was legal here at one point. We import quite a bit of hemp. Um, there's the dietary component of the plant with um you know, food additives, you know, a lot of us are, are already using those in our diet. So um, I, I call it kind of a three-prong approach. You have the nutritional side, you have the medicinal side, and then you have the, the textiles, the building supplies, the t-shirts, the substitution for all the plastic products we have in the market, the cotton in the market. So mm-hmm. one thing that's interesting is you're starting to see some folks that built out the tobacco industries and so on and so forth starting to look at hemp as a you know, a new commodity for them that they could eventually get into and kind of resurrect the farming community as well. So um, they've had some tough years, and uh, hopefully this crop getting back in play for them uh, done the right way will ultimately, you know, help everybody. Yeah, it's so it's so interesting to me, and it's just such a I think it's just like such a good thing for the farmers out there, and it's just more opportunity is the way I see it. So I love it, and I like that you brought that stat. I wasn't aware of that about twenty thousand different uses for it. Yeah, we're not we're not gonna have time to list all those today, Kevin. But <laughs> but hey, uh, that being said, uh, really appreciate you coming on the show today. If somebody's listening to this and they want more information um, on the three five seven company. What's the best way for them to get it? Well, go to our website at uh, www.357company.com. Um, we also have a phone number at 844-357-SHIP. Um, and I, I want to mention one last thing that's extremely important, and we're very proud. Of. 
we've gone out and secured um, through underwriting actual hemp cargo insurance. We have the, if anyone comes to us to ship their product up to a million dollars, we don't have to go through any underwriting. We have the policy. We own the policy. And hemp is actually in the wording. We are finding after the fact customers that are coming to us for their shipping needs have gone back and found out that those insurance policies they thought they had were just basic cargo. So when mm-hmm. you come work with us, that's the value we bring to you. We can We can protect your, you know, blood, sweat, and tears you just put into a full harvest season to make sure if any happens to that truck along the way that you are covered. So, you know, that's something that's very important that separates us, I feel, from a lot of the other folks that are trying to transport biomass around the country. Um, But going back to your question, website, um, the phone number is an easy way to get a hold of us. Um, LinkedIn is another platform, Instagram as well. Um, but uh, we encourage people to reach out well in advance from when they actually need to transport something. Too many times we're finding that this was an afterthought, but it's a significant expense that somebody's going to have to incur on the buyer and seller side. So we say, call us, let's talk through it. We'll jump on the phone with you. We don't just give out quotes. There's, I've yet to see one shipment the same as another one. So we very much customize our vehicles to what your needs are and then we move forward. But I, I, I encourage the entire industry to get way ahead of logistics and secure your logistics partner, even if it's an outsourced partner like 357, and, uh, you know, just check that box well in advance to any deals. Awesome. Well, hey, Kevin, uh, again, really appreciate you coming on the show today and sharing more about what you're doing over at the 357 company. And to the audience, as always, thank you for tuning in. Hope you got a lot of value out of this. Hope you had a lot of fun listening because we had fun making this and bringing it to you. So if you did, don't forget, subscribe to the podcast. I'll leave me a review on the Apple iTunes. And if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, Mission Matters Business, definitely give us a subscribe there and leave us some comments in the video section. Love to hear your thoughts and uh, what kind of projects you're working on. And Kevin, thanks again for coming on the show.